Good evening. Way to brave the weather. And we thank the Lord that uh, he's holding off the snow. It sounds like, uh, oh, perhaps three to seven more inches this evening. But uh, we have a clear parking lot, and uh, we will worship, and then you can go home and simply enjoy the snow and tell anybody tomorrow that you're snowed in. A couple announcements for you. After the introduction of our service, we will be uh, reading antiphonally Psalm 51, which is printed in your bulletin. Then there is a confession, and after that, the imposition of ashes. Tonight, given that everything is different during COVID, um, we'll have you come forward. You'll be masked, I'll be masked, I'll be gloved, and tonight we're going to be using a Q-tip so that I'm not going to use my same figure on all of your foreheads. You each get a different surface. So, huh. Also, during the imposition of ashes, as you are waiting or as you come back uh, to your seat, uh, we invite you to meditate on Psalm 90, and that is in your bulletin insert. I read from the beginning of the service um, as you open the bulletin on page uh, one, if you will. Ash Wednesday is the beginning of Lent. It is the service in which a crown, or excuse me, a cross of ashes is made on our foreheads. Ashes are a rich symbol in the Jewish Christian tradition. They suggest God's judgment on our sin, our own repentance, our own turning around, and our total dependence on God. We are reminded forcefully of the words in the burial service, earth to earth, ashes to ashes, dust to dust. One day, these words will be said over us. Ashes also suggest cleansing and renewal. They were once used as a cleansing agent in the absence of soap. On Ash Wednesday, the ashes have sometimes been understood as a penitential substitute for water as a sign of baptism. Water both stifles and refreshes, drowns and makes alive. So the ashes also tell of death and renewal. Psalm 51. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your steadfast love, according to your abundant mercy, blot out my transgressions. For I know my transgressions, my sin is ever before me. Indeed, I was born guilty, a sinner when my mother conceived me. Purge me with hyssop, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Hide your face from my sins and blot out all my iniquities. Do not cast me away from your presence and do not take your Holy Spirit from me. Brothers and sisters, we were created to experience joy and communion with God and live in harmony with each other and all of creation. But sin separates us from God, our neighbor and creation, so that we do not enjoy the life our Creator intended for us. 
as disciples of Jesus Christ, we are called to struggle against everything that leads us away from love of God and neighbor. I invite you, therefore, to commit yourselves to this struggle, to confess your sins, asking our Father for strength to persevere in following our Lord Jesus Christ. Most holy and merciful Father, we confess to you and to one another that we have sinned in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart, mind, strength. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We have not forgiven others as we have been forgiven. We have been deaf to your call to serve as Christ served us. We have grieved your Holy Spirit. We confess to you, Lord, all our unfaithfulness, our pride, and impatience in our lives. Our self-indulgent appetites and ways, and our exploitation of other people. Our anger at ourselves, and our envy of those more fortunate than ourselves. Our excessive love of worldly goods and comforts, and our dishonesty in daily life and work. Our negligence in prayer and worship, and our failure to share the faith that is in us. Accept our repentance, Lord, for the wrongs we have done, for our blindness to human need and suffering, and our indifference to injustice and cruelty. Create in me a clean heart, O God. Cast me not away from your presence. Restore to me the joy of your salvation. of your salvation. By the cross and passion of your Son, our Lord, Almighty God, have mercy on us. Forgive us all our sins through Jesus Christ. Strengthen us in all goodness. And by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep us in eternal life. Amen.
Our first reading is from Joel chapter 2, beginning with the 12th verse. Yet even now, says the Lord, return to me with all your heart, with fasting, with weeping, and with mourning. Rend your hearts and not your clothing. Return to the Lord your God, for he is gracious and merciful, slow to anger, and abounding in steadfast love, and relents from punishing. Our second reading is from 2 Corinthians chapter 5. So we are ambassadors for Christ, since God is making his appeal through us. We entreat you on behalf of Christ to be reconciled with God. For our sake he made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. As we work together with him, we urge you also not to accept the grace of God in vain. For he says, at an acceptable time, I have listened to you. And on a day of salvation, I have helped you. See, now is the acceptable time. See, now is the day of salvation. Here ends the readings. I read from Mark's Gospel, chapter 1, verse 29 and following. Some of you may have heard this reading two weeks ago, I believe it was. Jesus has just been to the Jewish synagogue for worship. He has been teaching. It was quite an event. Someone is um, captured by the darkness and the evil one, and Jesus frees him. As soon as they left the synagogue, they entered the house of Simon and Andrew with James and John. Now Simon's mother-in-law was in bed with a fever, and they told him about her at once. He came, took her by the hand, and lifted her up. Then the fever left her, and she began to serve them. That evening at sundown, they, were, they brought to him all who were sick or possessed with demons, and the whole city was gathered around the door. He cured many who were sick with various diseases, and he cast out many demons, and he would not permit the demons to speak because they knew him. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus the Christ. After this 11 months of COVID, I've realized that these 40 days of Lent might be well spent for us in a time of healing. And so on these Wednesday nights, we will gather here at 7, about 45 minutes mostly, and uh, we will pick out a different or maybe two or three healings of Jesus and look at them during this season. Many of us have been, have experienced uh, sickness, loneliness, cabin fever, frustration, uh, many things over this last year. And so we set aside these Wednesdays before Easter as a time of healing. So we heard those words from Mark chapter 1. He left the synagogue, entered the house of Simon. Simon's mother-in-law was in bed with a fever, and they told him about her at once. Who do you think told Jesus about Simon's mother-in-law? Take a guess. Hmm? I've always thought it was the disciples. And then today, another thought occurred to me. Who else might have told Jesus about Simon's mother-in-law? Hmm? It may have been Peter's wife, because she was related how? She is the daughter of the mother-in-law. Or maybe there were some children, or maybe there was somebody else. It may very well have been the disciples. 
or it was Simon's wife herself. We don't know. As I got thinking about this, fever. Generally no big deal. No broken bones, no nothing wrong with the heart or lungs, no swelling. Fever, what's the big deal? A fever is a sign of what? An infection. It could be bacterial, it could be viral, right? It is the whole body fighting against something. The whole system is affected. There's nothing specific wrong. It's not a, a problem with the hand or the foot, elbow or something. But the whole body is burning up. All our energy is going to fight that infection. Peter's mother-in-law is left in bed, exhausted. Sounds like COVID? Yeah. How many have had COVID here? We've had several, yes. Thank God you are here. Exhaustion is the word I heard from several of you. I can't believe I was so tired. Over and over, day after day, simply exhaustion. Fatigue like I've never felt before, wiped out. And so even though there was no cut, no broken bone, no concussion, nothing specific, it's a whole body fatigue. Did you feel like doing anything else? Maybe not. Peter's mother-in-law has a fever. She's in bed. She's wiped out. Now, question. When she hears that Jesus has arrived, what do you think she would want to do if she was healthy? She'd want to greet him. And then what? Come, come, come into our home. What can I get you? Right? She wants to show him hospitality, but she cannot. This fever has laid her low. She cannot even get out of bed. She would treat him as the honored guest and provide a meal and bring out her, I'm not sure if there was silverware, but that kind of thing. She is zapped of all her strength, and so there she lies. Jesus hears about her. And he goes over to lift her up and heal her. Now, I have heard, I remember one person commenting on this text said, well, Jesus healed her because he was hungry. I find that rather short-sighted. Were there others in the house that could have provided food? Well, who? Her daughter. Peter's mother-in-law, excuse me, Peter's wife. And we do hear a little bit more about her in some other places, but we don't know what her name is, and we don't know a great deal about her. But Peter is married, and in the household is not only Peter and his wife, but Peter's brother, Andrew, not sure if he has a family, and then, of course, Peter's mother-in-law. Why is it that Jesus heals Peter's mother-in-law? What do you think? What is it? Exactly. He cares. It's not simply self-serving because he wants a meal. He cares about her because he cares about you. And so when he hears that she is in need, he goes to her, takes her by the hand, and lifts her up. And as he does, the fever leaves her. She is made whole. And then what does she do? She gets up and serves him. Because she's feeling guilty? No, because that's what she wants to do. Jesus comes to heal. The thief comes only to do what? Steal, kill, destroy. You can read that in John 10. The thief, the enemy, comes only to steal, kill, and destroy. As we mentioned a couple weeks ago, the thief, our enemy, would love to take 
our joy away from us, our hope, our confidence, our health, our energy, our focus, our love, our patience, our family, our health. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. What does Jesus say? I have come that they might have life and have it to the full. Jesus comes to heal this woman because that's what he comes to do. We heard in our second lesson, today is the day of salvation. And most of the time when we hear salvation, we think, well, that means coming to believe in Jesus and that means being saved and that means going to heaven. Yes. But day to day, it means even more, daily. The word salvation, what word is hidden in it? Sav. What do you do with sav? You put it on something. <laughs> oh, last week, I ran my finger into the sharp edge of our cupboard twice. Three days between them, in exactly the same spot. Ouch. And then I put some salve on it. Why? To help it to heal. To help it become whole. Salvation. The word salvation, first of all, means to heal. To restore. To give life. To give health. And then its broader meaning is that ultimately we are made whole in the very presence of God with life that never ends. But often we forget the day-to-day -day meaning of salvation, of salve. And we focus so much on heaven that we forget that God is here and now. And that Jesus came that he might restore and heal and give life. So in these next few weeks, after these 11 months of COVID, of staying in your home day after day, I'm thinking of two cousins of mine in Minnesota who hadn't left their home for nine months. I'm thinking, ooh, gosh, get some fresh air or something. But in this time of COVID, loneliness, hurt, um, frustration, sometimes being sick. It's time for us to spend some time healing. And so during these weeks, we will look at who Jesus is and how he responded to the, the paralytic, the man who could not walk, and the four friends who picked him up and brought him to Jesus. Or we'll hear about Jesus' conversation and his action with the man whose son was an epileptic. And Jesus will say to the man, how long has he been this way? Do you think that had anything to do with healing the son? No. It had to do with caring for the father. And Jesus ends up doing both. Or the man who could not either hear or speak and how Jesus takes him away from the crowd and privately heals him. No show, no look at me, all for the one, the man. Each night we will gather on Wednesday nights. We will worship with the peaceful uh, hold and evening prayer service. We'll spend some time in silence. We'll learn how to be quiet in a busy, noisy world. And then we will focus looking at Jesus as he responds to different people each evening. Be also thinking about yourselves. In what ways do you desire to be whole? How might he come with healing and hope in your life. We will spend a time for healing. Let us pray.
Lord, often people ask the question, well, it's up to the Lord whether he wants you healed or not. And Lord, we are coming to believe that you want all of us well. There is not a word in the Gospels where someone came to you for healing and you said, no, I think the Father wants you sick. Person after person, hurt after hurt, dashed dreams after dashed dreams, and you come like you did to Peter's mother-in-law and you extend your hand to each of us. And you take our hand and lift us up. Lord, beginning this night, would you come and touch each of us just at the place where we need you the most? Will you come into our questions and our doubts, our hurts and our darkness? Come and take us by the hand and then lead us to a place that will make us whole. Finally, our hope is in you, for you are our life, our truth, our hope. Amen. We offer with joy and thanksgiving what you have first given us, ourselves, our time, our possessions, signs of your gracious love, 
receive them for the sake of him who offered himself for us, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. <clears throat> Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. In the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread. He gave thanks, broke it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this, remembering me. After supper, he took the cup. He gave thanks and gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, poured out for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this, remembering me. We pray the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. So instructions of how we will do communion. As you come forward in the center aisle, I ask you to leave your mask on. When you come to receive the bread, please open your hands very wide and leave them that way. of each tomorrow. Give us peace beyond our fear and hope beyond our sorrow. We stand. The body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ strengthen you and keep you in his grace. Amen. Let us pray. We give you thanks, O oh God, that you've refreshed us through the healing power of this gift of life. In your mercy, strengthen us in faith toward you and in fervent love toward one another for the sake of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Receive the benediction. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen.
Go in peace, serve the Lord. Thanks be to God.